artists and animators, and welcome to the Animation Trends event. Mark Simon is an Atlanta-based artist. His career includes being a story artist, producer, and director for both live action and animated projects, as well as authoring 10 popular industry texts and writing for major trade publications. We invited Mark onto our live stream to discuss the process of storyboarding for live action. Mark, welcome to the stream. Uh, thanks to be here. Good to see you again, Mike. So, Mark, let's start with an introduction. Uh, how would you describe your career path into storyboarding and directing? Fun. It's how I would describe it. Uh, like I get to draw every day for a living, so you know life is pretty great. Uh, I, I started in Hollywood back in the '80s. Uh, I grew up in Texas, lived all over the country, but grew up in Texas, uh, mostly in a construction family. So when I decided to move out to Hollywood in 1986, I knew my way in to Hollywood. Uh, I, I either wanted to be an animator or a designer, and uh, figured construction would work. Now, I did do a test on He-Man, and I failed it miserably or spectacularly because uh, I was a self-taught animator. So I had a great way of doing dope sheets. I just did not do dope sheets the way the industry did. I didn't realize you had to work your way up. So I just went straight in trying to be an animator. So I failed. Uh, He-Man running across a room and sliding into an elevator was the test, except he ran through the back of the elevator the way I did my dope sheet. So they said, no, thanks. And so I moved into live action for years and I started in con uh, designing sets. And within two weeks, I was art directing. So my first movie, I was I started as an art director and I did that for years. I helped open up Nickelodeon. I was the second designer at Nickelodeon when it went national. Um, and it wasn't until I, I started doing storyboarding full time uh, for Steven Spielberg on Sequest, the big NBC series back in the 90s. And that's when I decided, oh, drawing and telling stories and working with directors, this is this is my new career. And so since 92, I've been doing full-time storyboarding, uh, around 6,000 productions now. Uh, so you know, I get to draw every day and then see my work on the big screen and the small screen. So uh, that's a real brief version of it. But uh, you know, 35 years in the industry or more now, and it's been awesome. So uh, I heard that one of your first jobs was with Roger Corman, uh, the Pope of Pop Cinema. And I just have to ask, what was that experience like? Uh, it was a, an experience of learning how not to look at your hourly rate. I, it, was a, it was a flat rate and it was unbelievable amounts of hours. I was working over 100 hours a week on a low budget movie called Slave Girls from Beyond Infinity. Uh, and you're right, it was my first movie. It was my first project out in L.A. Uh, I, I, I worked for a brief time at a set building company to see the difference between building homes and building sets. But when I left and I started working freelance, uh, Corman Studio was the first one I got hired at. Uh, I was hired as construction coordinator on this sci-fi film. And two weeks later, I became the art director. And um, I just stayed as art director or production designer for years till I moved into storyboarding. Um, and uh, it was it was great because... Being a low budget movie, you've got to be very creative. And we were building forests and uh, huge logs over a thousand foot canyons, but we had no budget for visual effects or even blue screen or anything. So I was designing in camera effects and things that I had learned either in film school or things I learned from reading Cinefix magazine. You know, that's, you know, RIP for that. That's been gone for a couple of years now, but. Uh, you know, like I, I, I designed and built four, uh, 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 foreground miniatures um, that lined up perfectly in camera to the actual set beyond. And it worked first time we set it up. I designed beam splitters, um, uh, miniature work, uh, foreground, um, front screen projection, rear screen projection, uh, anything and everything. I mean, it was amazing the kind of stuff we did. So it was an absolute blast. Uh, it was hands-on completely because it was such a small crew. And uh, I, I loved it. And then I realized I was making like a buck and a half an hour. Uh, but luckily it was a short-term project. You know, those films don't last very long. So uh, then, you know, I made two and a half times that much on my next project. And I doubled it again on my next one. So, you know, within a year I was making decent money. 
but you got to start somewhere. So, you know, and I was a fan of the Corman movies, you know, back in the eighties, we all knew who Roger Corman was. He's the king of B budget movies or the, you know, the Pope of pop culture, as you said, uh, pop cinema. Um, and he's got a great book, how I made a hundred movies without losing a dime, uh, that I was a fan of. And I, I had read so, uh, and half of Hollywood at that point got started there. I mean, Jack Nicholson and Roger, or, uh, uh, Jim Cameron got their start. Uh, in fact, I used, I got there about a year after Cameron was, uh, was, uh, he was an art director and started, he directed Piranha 2 out of the same studio. We, we called it the Lumberyard. It's down in Venice in, in Southern LA. And uh, it was a converted lumber yard with these terrible, tiny little sound stages. And uh, I would just find anything I could. And they had a tiny little boneyard of discarded sets. And I would use anything I could find in there to afford building the sets we needed for the sci-fi movie. I, I could ask you for hours and hours about practical effects and in-camera effects, because I, I just find the whole thing uh, very fascinating and very inventive. But uh, we're here to talk about live action storyboarding. So uh, oh, how is storyboarding on a live action series different from 2D animation? Well, there, there's a few differences. Um, one, the probably the biggest difference that directors ask for immediately is they don't want to see cartoony artwork. So, you know, it needs to be realistic, you know, like this sample here from The Walking Dead that, that I've got up. Obviously, it's not cartoony. That's uh, that's. It, it's more akin to uh, in a live action or realistic illustration. Uh, even though they can be really rough, they just can't be cartoony. Uh, and the other is we do as few drawings as possible to uh, simulate or to represent the action of the stunt or special effect or whatever it is that we're storyboarding rather than every keyframe. Animation, you are the actor, you are the director, you're guiding the the characters to do every single thing in live action. We're not telling the actors how to act. And uh, in fact, let me pull up this uh, an image. You and I were looking at this just prior. And so for instance, this is Greg Nicotero director and executive producer of the walking dead working with some of my storyboards on set. So, I drew as few panels as possible for each scene. And, and that's the other thing. Numbering is different from live action animation. In live action, um, a scene is everything that takes place in one location at one period in time. And you've got a whole bunch of different shots in each scene. Whereas in animation, at least in 2D animation, every time there's a cut, it's considered a new scene. And then you group scenes into a sequence. And luckily, Storyboard Pro, you can dictate in there if you're numbering for live action or numbering for animation. So the software makes it easy for us to jump back and forth. So here you can see we printed out all my storyboards for the sequence that happened in a, uh, a museum in downtown Atlanta. And some of these were mixed. There was a light, uh, there was a, elements were shot on set. Others were blue screen and other elements were you know, on the actual location. And so we need to make sure we got every element for each shot. And so he would mark them off or demarcate, you know, the S meant it was a set, the D, I don't remember what that stood for. And X meant he got all the elements to it. And so this is for the entire crew to see. And it's, it's like a to-do list and we just mark off everything. So by the end of the day, we know, are we done? Do we get every shot we need so that it will edit together? So if I did, I if I did really like cool animation, yeah, there, there wouldn't be enough room for a thousand drawings and directors don't want to go through <laughs> tons and tons of drawings. That's not the purpose of a live action storyboard. We're there to set up the shots and in, in the major action, not all the keyframes. I think it's also really cool to see uh, pre-production images being used this way, where you have a very concrete um, relationship between pre-production and what's being shot. Yeah, it's, I love going on set and see this. And, and I've got a couple other pictures from other productions, some of which I can't show yet. But, you know, to walk on set and see my storyboards blown up and being on these big sheets of foam core. Um, in fact, on, on The Walking Dead, uh, on the main series, because I storyboard on all four different Walking Dead shows. And so on, on this one, we, we've got our own back lot in Sonoya, which is just south of, of Atlanta. 
So the sound stages are there, the back lot with Hilltop and, and a whole bunch of the other locations are all there. And so when we go on the back lot, they mount these uh, foam, this foam core onto a little golf cart and they drive the golf cart next to the camera. So it's a, a literally a movable storyboard that, that goes along with it. So m no matter where we are, the crew can look, say, okay, we're doing this shot. Oh, I see what needs to happen. And they know what to clear, what to set up or whatever. So th this is literally the blueprint for the 700 people on the crew to all work towards just that one image of the director's vision. Oh, so, you know, that's uh, another difference. You... Just real quick. The, yeah. One of the biggest differences between live action and animation in live action, our job is to capture the director's vision in animation. The story artist is the visual director, at least in 2d in 2d TV feature film. It's different. And it really depends on the production on how it goes. But in live action, it's not my vision. It's the director's vision. So in, and there's a very particular talent on digging into a director's head quickly to get what they want. Because a lot of directors, uh, live action directors, complain about working with story artists because they don't, they say, well, it's an exercise, but I don't really get what I want, so I don't use them that much. Well, that tells me the storyboard's failed. You know, if the, it's, it's the greatest tool in the world if it's the director's vision, because the director's going to shoot what the director wants. And some story artists who come out of animation have a chip on their shoulder thinking, well, they should do what I create. Well, no, that's not your job. Your job is to illustrate the director's vision for the rest of the crew to work from. I, I think that's actually a really interesting point because that, that's that's not like a, a hard skill like um, draftsmanship or uh, understanding how to compose a shot. That is understanding how to communicate with somebody. What kinds of questions do you ask to like really drill in to get uh, what a creator's a, a director's vision is for the scene? Well, you know, there's there's a thousand questions and it will vary each time. But I mean, when I'm going into it, I'm asking them, what are they wearing? What's you know, let's take a look at the location. So, you know, I, I whenever possible, I like to walk a location or a set with the director and then we can figure out together what the shots are. So even though I'm getting the director's vision doesn't mean I don't have input. I'm always trying to plus it and helping them create the shots. But I don't argue what they want. I try to plus what they want. And there's a big difference and there's a fine line uh, on how to how to handle if there's a if you think it should go one way, the director thinks it should go another. Well, it goes the director's way. That's why they're the director. So, you know, you pick your battles and because uh, it's the director's vision. Um, which so I'll work off a plot plan, you know, in overhead view of something. And, and, or, or if we're out there, we'll take pictures from certain directions or I'll use, uh, action figures and, and we'll, we'll pose action figures, sometimes take photos. Otherwise I'll, I'll have my camera, you know, uh, my fingers, you know, where, where do you want the camera? And, or the director will say, if we're doing virtual, like you and I are doing right now, the director will act it out for me. Uh, sometimes some directors will sketch really crappy little storyboards. And then I'll ask questions of, is that just a bad drawing or is that supposed to be a profile? Um, and, and sometimes I just start sketching. And because the story of a pro, it's easy for me to adjust, you know, how big or small something is. And, you know, when they say I want to see a close up, different directors have different visions of what a close up. Because the true close up is, is, you know, mid chest to a little above the head. Some directors like a little tighter. Some want a character, you know, off center, you know, when you're doing rule of thirds, others want it directly centered. It, it varies. And so one of the things you do is also study what a director has done. You look at their other work and there's certain things that I look for when I'm working with a director so that when I sit with them, I know, oh, this is how they like to balance. Oh, they like a stationary camera or they like handheld, the cameras moving around or they like a long lens. Uh, so I know that coming in. So when I start sketching, I'm I, my initial roughs while I'm working with them are what I have seen them do before. So that helps me get closer, but I'm getting approvals in real time as I'm thumbnailing because I'm sketching as they're talking, as, as we talk through shot by shot. And then I go away and I do the cleanup and make it look nicer. Uh, so I don't care how bad my art is when I'm working with the director. It's all about speed because they've got a thousand other things to do. 
but they never have to have a follow-up meeting with me because I'm getting approvals on our first meeting. And then I just, I do my cleanup. And, but I mean, even down to camera moves and layer moves, I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm giving them a full animatic in real time as, as I'm sketching. Whereas a lot of other artists get notes, go away, do a rough, come back, and it's almost all wrong. The director would say, oh, well, that's not the screen direction I was thinking, or, you know, I'd rather this character was doing this instead. And then you're doing a lot of redrawing. So that takes up more of the director's time. I prefer to get it right the first time. So uh, I know that this is uh, so somewhat of an impossible question, but what was a typical day like on a production like The Walking Dead? Well, before COVID, it was completely different than post-COVID. So before COVID, on The Walking Dead, on, uh, on the first day of pre-production for me, I would go out to, uh, uh, to the offices and I would walk the sets or locations with the director and then we would come back and we would sit in. I they gave me one of the small conference rooms and I would. In fact, I might have a picture of, of one of them while we're talking. I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, oh, yeah, here. So th this is actually the big conference room. So I would sit. In fact, this is my little uh, Cintiq here uh, on, the, on the desk. I would sit next to the big screen. And here you can see um, this is Storber Pro. It's up on on the big monitor. The director would sit somewhere else here and as we would be going over it, I'm sketching and the director without having to look over my shoulder could look at the monitor behind me and give me notes, suggestions, corrections, whatever it was uh, as we were as we're working. Um, and then during a pre-production, after I would do the boards, I would sit in during the pre-production meeting and as we're going through the shots, I would run through each one so all the crew heads could be giving their input or they could be seeing what it is that we were doing. Um, post COVID, I don't go to locations anymore. No story artist does productions limit how many people are on set or in the office. And if you can work virtually, you do. So I now rely on plot plans, construction plans, uh, set illustrations, location photos, things like that. Uh, which makes it a bit tougher. Uh, it's not as interactive. Um, so, uh, so then it's just the director and I doing a virtual meeting like this, and I would share my screen of Storyboard Pro, and they would be seeing this as I'm drawing in real time. Now, to kind of give you an idea on on a schedule, because you know, day by day it, it definitely changes. So well, let's just talk about The Walking Dead. The Walking Dead shoots in eight days. It's an eight-day shoot, a five-day week, so it's eight days of shooting. And in live action, you alternate. So one director is prepping while another one is shooting. So you never get the same director two episodes in a row unless they gang them together. So if there's eight days of shooting, that means there's eight days of prep. On day one of prep, there's generally no script. Not for the entire crew, anyway. Script won't be finalized. Actually, it's never finalized, but it's not ready for production until day three or four of prep. So if it's ready on day three, during the day three and early morning of four, the director and the first AD and the director of photography, the DP, look at it and go, okay, here's the sequences we want to storyboard, which are going to be stunts and visual effects, sometimes fancy camera moves or, or transitions. We don't have time to storyboard an entire production. Uh, you know, an hour long show, I can't storyboard that in two or three days. So, um, and they need my storyboards as soon as possible because it affects what they're building and what they're setting up and camera gear and, and stunts and all that kind of stuff. So I'll get a call the morning of day four. Can you meet tonight or on day five to meet with the director? And then within a couple of days, I have to have the storyboards finished. Some shows have a little more lead time, uh, like uh, Stranger Things, there's 21 or 22 days per episode. So obviously we have a lot more time uh, for storyboarding. Um, so I would meet with the director, get approvals on my thumbnails from that one meeting. Then I go back to my studio here and I would uh, start doing cleanups. And then every night I would export both a PDF and a movie for the director send it to them in case they had any notes or thoughts, or sometimes there's rewrites of the script that affect what I drew. And I'll either have another short meeting because none of what I drew is going to change 
because the director's already approved it. So it's almost 100% that it's going to be approved unless there's been a change or they lost a location. Like I'm doing a show. Uh, one of the shows I'm, I'm doing today is Bad Monkey. It's a Vince Vaughn show shooting in Miami. And I, uh, last week I storyboarded this big car chase and, and cars crashing into each other and airbags going off and people flying through windows and stuff. They rewrote the script. So it changes who's driving is different and the action is different. Now there's gunshots instead of someone being choked to death. So I'm reboarding most of that because it was a script change. Um, so in that case, if it's a minor change, the director will just mark up the PDF and send it back to me. If there's bigger, we'll jump on a, a quick Zoom call, share my screen, and I'll make whatever revisions in real time with them. But I mean, I even do my own voice tracks on here. Sometimes I'll add sound effects because it takes minutes. You know, it's not even hours. It's minutes to make something that is not just a print, but now the director can see, will my vision cut together? Will it really play the way I want it to? So the animatic aspect of it makes me a better story artist because I can see as I'm going, oh, do we need to add or change something here? And I'll make those suggestions. Or the director will say, you know, that we're sitting too long or, or th this isn't coming across right. Let's try this instead. The video aspect of it, you know, the animatic, makes everything better and everyone can do their job better earlier. Because it's if, if they want to make a change because the original idea didn't, didn't work as well, it's cheap having me redo it. It's very expensive to have a crew of 700 people go back for a reshoot. So, you know, productions, as long as they understand, the story artist changes in time we spend saves them a multitude of times the cost of what it costs to hire me or any other story artist. Yeah, uh, that, that's a definitely an interesting point uh, about how pre-production can save a production uh, budget. Uh, especially oh, on revisions. Um, one of the things that you hear when talking with uh, storyboard artists in animation, uh, one of the cliches when uh, you get like a director who's from live action uh, doing interviews or writers, they'll say things like, in animation, we can do anything. In animation, we have an unlimited special effects budget, which is great until you get to a crowd scene or until you need to do a certain type of Fire camera move. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, are there things in live action that uh, you need to account for just because of the physical realities of filming that you might not have to do on a animated production? It depends on on the show and the budget. I mean, we've got uh, crowd shots of 10,000 in, in The Walking Dead, you know, these hordes of zombies. Um, you know, so there, there's there's a limitation on how many how much time they have to shoot setups and, and shoot the live action elements. And sometimes there's a limitation on how many visual effects an episode can have. Uh, that's not up to me to worry about. The director has their vision. He and uh, he or she and I, because it's generally 50% men, 50% women on directors. Most shows alternate. So it's half and half, which is great. Um, so once, once the director gets their vision down, then the producer and the UPM, the unit production manager or line producer go through it. Say, oh, we can't afford some of these shots, scale it back. Uh, so, for instance, Snowfall, uh, one of the shows on FX, I think. I actually don't even remember what network it's on. Um, but I, I've been storyboarding Snowfall for a few seasons, too. And, and we had this one episode with a tiger in it. And, of course, we couldn't have a live tiger. We had ILM animate the tiger. So I did pretty detailed storyboards on that, uh, showing the action of everything that we needed the tiger to do. And we needed to cut the number of shots of the tiger in half after we got the director's vision because every shot of a tiger from ILM cost so much money and they only had so much in their budget. So then the director and I went back through and said, oh, we can gang these shots together. Let's just make this one longer and we can, we can cut around the tiger doing this, this and this. And uh, so you know, it, it was a bit of a back and forth, but it's easier to do a back and forth in pre-production with storyboards than it is when you get out there and realize, oh, we can't do this. Then, then you've got a problem when you get into into editorial, and, and the show won't cut together. So, uh, again, my animatics allowed them to really see it and figure it out. It's much easier to see something moving on screen and determine what works and what doesn't than it is to look at just a printed storyboard. I'm a huge believer in animatics. I do it on everything. 
So uh, you mentioned that you have uh, animatics and storyboards. Do you want to walk us through some of the uh, storyboards from live action productions that you have uh, prepared today? Sure. Let me, let me show you this this one. So this, what, I, what I'm going to play, I, I've edited together a bunch of these. They're all over YouTube and, and my website, and I call them storyboard comparisons. A few artists do it now. I was the first to edit these together years and years and years ago, where I edited my animatics to the final cut. So you can see how close I was able to get to the director's vision. So this is from the original series, uh, both seasons nine and 10 of The Walking Dead. Different directors on different ones. This first sequence is by Greg Nicotero, uh, the great visual effects, special uh, uh, makeup effects director. And Greg's also a great artist. So he would actually uh, sketch up um, usually not many storyboards because he didn't have time, but he would design and his crew would design the makeup effects of the different walkers. So what you'll see here in a second is this walker gets his face sliced off. So here you can see how accurate my drawing was. It's because I had the original design, so I knew what it was going to look like. But, I, you know, I really love looking at these and see how close my initial storyboard was to the final cut. And it's right on. <laughs> I just love drawing this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, and it, it's exciting. I mean, to really see your work come to life like this. Um, you know, so it's doing this, it's fun. It's a way to promote my work. Uh, it's a way that I can showcase to directors who haven't worked with me before, especially, you know, those live action directors who don't like working with story artists. I'll show them, no, this is what a good storyboard does when we capture your vision. And they're like, oh, okay. And it makes all the difference in the world. Now, obviously I'm not the only one. There are a lot of really great live action story artists. Um, there's just, we just very seldom talk. There's no group association or get togethers of live action story artists, uh, which there was. Oh, this was a fun sequence. So this was huge in the comic hmm. books, this reveal of, of when the whispers um, uh, cut the heads off of, of a lot of the key actors. So I was lucky enough to storyboard the sequence <laughs> in, in the series. Um, and, you know, again, looking at, you know, even the slow push-ins, and it's almost exact. So it's, oh yeah, I just get such a thrill um, you know, looking at this. This this inspires me to keep doing what I'm doing, you know, when I get to see these. And, and I like my storyboards to look like the actors. So I use a lot of reference material. Um, it, it makes it easier to follow. Uh, it inspires the crew. So my story art, like that's really rough, but a lot of my storyboards are tighter than what you might see in a lot of live action. But, you know, they give me the time to do it and the tighter art inspires the crew. And, you know, mm -hmm. if I can help inspire a better production, you bet I'm going to spend the time to do that. Plus, it's fun. As an artist, I get to do this. I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, I also love seeing these shot comparisons too, because uh, a lot of people don't see pre-production art. Yeah, they don't. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough, like the Talking Dead has profiled my work a number of times. Um, I've been interviewed uh, myself, I think three different times um, on there. Oh, in fact, so let me pull up this one. Speaking of, of the, uh, the, the Talking Dead, so, I okay, so here's Chris Hardwick, the host, and I wanted to be on the show again. This is, I guess, another season, and um, and in order to get on on, I actually drew Chris Hardwick into the storyboards because I figured if he saw what I had done, they would profile me on the show, and that's exactly what happened. So, so this is a short little piece. Check this out. 
Here's one that's over on Mark Simon, whose job it is to draw and map out all the scenes to be shot in an episode before the camera even rolls. And here he's explaining a very special Easter egg he drew in prepping the storyboard for tonight's episode. I'm excited about this one. <laughs> So at the very end of the episode, Denai's character, Michonne, is cutting through the very last walker here. And the walker's body falls away, revealing Judith, Michonne's daughter. And we finally see them getting together, but she's being attacked by a walker. So Judith shows how capable she is, cuts the legs out from the walker, it falls, she hops on top, and she stabs it through the eye. Here in the background, this is... Judith's character here sitting on top of the dead walker. We see another walker falling behind her from underneath. It's been kind of hidden. It reaches up, it grabs Judith by the arm, and we see it's the nice character Michelle dispatching it. But here's the fun thing, because I know he's a really big fan. This walker is actually Chris Hardwick. I looked up how he dressed up as walkers before, and I designed this, or I drew this exactly to his makeup. So, the very last walker in this shot is Chris Hardwick. <laughs> so, so it works. Fun detail. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not above, and I've done that. I've added the directors in at times. I, I, I drew Greg Nicotero in as a, uh, he and I together as two walkers were attacking. So I did, I drew it to look like he and I, and he noticed it right away. So, you know, it, it, I have fun with it. I had little things here and there. What was the conversation like when uh, they brought you on to The Walking Dead? Had you followed the comics previously, or how was the uh, series pitched to you? Uh, I, I was a big fan of the comics and a big fan of the series. Um, I, I was living in Orlando for the first number of seasons when the show was on, and I was waiting until my kids graduated high school before I, I wanted to move to Atlanta. And four years ago, uh, almost five years ago now when we decided to move, I, I, I knew one of my goals when I moved up here, because I live in Atlanta now, one of my goals was to work on The Walking Dead because I was such a huge fan. And, and uh, Steve Campbell is an old, old friend of mine. He and I have been working together since the early 90s, and he was one of the DPs on the show. So I called Steve up, and, and it was in between seasons, and I told Steve, I said, look, I really want to work on the show. Is there any, any producer you can introduce me to? I said, I'll take it from there. I just need an entree in. And uh, Steve said, well, let me, let me talk around and see if I can find someone for you to speak with. So uh, he, he called me back and he said, all right, here's phone number of Tom Luce. He's the supervising producer and uh, we're in between seasons now. It's a good time to give him a call. So I called Tom up and uh, I said, Tom, I'm going to be up in, up in Atlanta next week. And I was just making it up. I had no plans. Uh, I, I said, you know, I've worked with Steve before. He goes, yeah, Steve, and, and mentioned how great you are. I said, like, I'd love to come up and show you how I work. I'm different than most other story artists you've worked with. I'm more efficient, and I can provide you more with uh, animatics that you've never had before. Uh, I'd love to show you what I do and how I do it. And uh, he said, uh, great, what days? I said, I'll, I'll change my schedule. When do you have available time? He told me and what time to be there. I drove in specifically just to get there. I made sure I, I got there really early. I just sat in my car outside. So I came in at exactly the right time and I showed him my stuff and I showed him how I work and how accurate I am to the director's vision. And he said, this looks great. He said, we're not quite starting prep yet. Give, uh, give me a call in two weeks or three weeks or whatever it was, he said. Um, and, you know, at that point, I'll know more about our schedule. And being a, a business owner, I knew that was a test because a big part of hiring people is follow through. Do they listen? So I knew, okay, he's going to expect a call on this day. If I don't do it, I won't get the gig. So I called that morning. I said, hey, it's Mark following up when, when you said, he goes, great, call this number and you'll start. I mean, that was it. Just the fact I followed up, he hired me right then, right then and there. So uh, I started, that was on season nine, I think is when I started on the walking dead and um uh, and the ser series started right before i moved i hadn't closed on my house yet so i did the first episode or two virtually uh, out of orlando and then once i uh, once i closed on my house and i was still rebuilding my uh, the studio you see here behind me uh i would go down and i would work out of the studios uh, in sonoya and 
and just kind of went on and on. Then, uh, then World Beyond started. So I started storyboarding uh, Walking Dead World Beyond. And then uh, one of the directors, uh, one of the directors from The Walking Dead really loved working with me. He said, I really want to bring you on to Fear, but they already have someone based in Texas. I'll get you in when I can. So halfway through season six, he goes, look, I think I can get you in on this episode. So then I started storyboarding Fear, and I've been storyboarding Fear ever since. And then when they started Tales of the Walking Dead, which is the anthology series that comes out this fall, I storyboarded that whole series as well. So it's, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of zombies uh, over the last four years or so, and it has absolutely been a blast. But, you know, in the meantime, you know, it's been, you know, 20, 30, 40 other series or something like that that I've been doing as well. What do you think draws people towards zombies? mindless mayhem, you know, who doesn't want to just punch something when you get angry at it? And, and, you know, there's no repercussions because it's not a living person. Um, there's gore, there's excitement, there's danger. I, you know, I don't know. It's just fun. And, uh, you know, I, I love it. I get a kick out of it. Uh, I, you know, and it's funny cause I, you know, a lot of people ask me, so what do you prefer to storyboard? It's like, you know, I do, I love comedy. Uh, you know, I'm good at making people laugh. I understand it. I've, I've directed and, and produced a lot of comedy things. Um, and, but I love horror. I love science fiction. You know, Star Wars is why I got into this. You know, I was 13 when the first Star Wars came out and that first shot ships coming over. I was like <laughs> that, that I want that. And that was it. I mean, then was my goal to move to Hollywood um, because that opening shot, you know, and I'm not the only one. I mean, you'll find thousands of people who had that same feeling, um, you know, drama. You know, there's a certain pace and a way to get across a story. And I love trying to tell a story visually without dialogue, because if they understand it without the audio, you've done a great job with visual storytelling. And I love animation. You know, like I mentioned, I, you know, I, I failed my first animation test. Um, and this is back when we were still painting on cells. And then when digital ink and paint came out, even before uh, Harmony, uh, was, uh, AXA was the first software that I started using. And uh, I, I, bought this, I bought the suite and I trained myself, uh, built a portfolio of sample animation and landed Disney as my first client animating Tinkerbell. So, you know, my first job is Tinkerbell in, in animation as producer and lead animator. Um, and, 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 you know, I've, I've owned two animation studios. I sold the first one. Um, I still produce animation now and then, uh, I've done a lot of animated bits on, on different feature films for universal and Fox. Um, you know, so I love the art form. Uh, I love all art forms. You know, we do commercials, TV series features. You know, I, I jump back and forth constantly. I'm in the, I, I just wrapped one feature film about George Foreman. I'm just about done. I'm waiting on, on some new scenes on another Russell Peters comedy with Zach Galifianakis. Um, uh, there's a movie coming out next month on HBO Max, the new Father of the Bride. I storyboarded that. Uh, Alien X Miss, a stop motion animation that was on Netflix. So, I mean, it's, you know, I've done, I think, 61 or 62 features now, you know, in addition to everything else I've done. Congrats. So you mentioned that like Star Wars was your uh, big uh, like inspiration moment of, hey, there's something to like cinematography. And I feel like Star Wars is very much like a filmmaker's film in a lot of ways because like George Lucas had a lot of inspiration from Kurosawa. Um, are there any other films that like really inspire you and just make you like love the craft? Uh, anything by Spielberg. I mean, he's an absolute master. Um, I also love watching Hitchcock. Uh, Hitchcock was more into the the imagery than he was actors. He he actually didn't like actors. He he and Hitchcock started as a story artist. A lot of people don't realize that he was a professional storyboard artist before he became a director. So uh, he did a lot of his own uh, sketches. I mean, he had production illustrators who did the finer work, uh, but you know he knew his stuff. So. Um, uh, and, and as far as live or, or animation, the uh, the first Toy Story, um, even though it, it's amazing that that was the first CG film because it's a perfect movie. And and one of the things that I, that I do in a lot of my lectures, I'll actually break down shot by shot without the audio, turn off the audio and watch it. 
everything the the story is being told visually i mean there there's one shot in particular that i just loved uh, showing people you know the first time that we meet uh, buzz lightyear right woody had fallen off the bed off the back of the bed the camera starts on buzz's feet and and goes up and there's a front light on him and his shadow is being cast across the bed woody comes up from the, behind the bed literally in buzz's shadow and that's the thrust of the entire movie that woody's in buzz's shadow and is used to being at the forefront of Andy's uh, attention. And just to think about, wow, he literally put him in Buzz's shadow. That to me is absolute story, visual storytelling brilliance. And that is throughout that movie. So that movie, if you just look at it without the audio, it is spectacularly brilliant shot for shot. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, so, uh, with that in mind, how would you describe like what the job of a storyboard artist really is? Well, we're visual storytellers. You know, like a lot of people in in the trade, I'm a comic book fan, and uh, there's a lot of similarities. I've I've had a number of comic book artists work for me as as story artists. There's a few things that are different, um, obviously as far as layout and, and flow and screen direction that, that they have to learn and, and know the difference. But um, it, the, again, it varies in, in live action, you know, you capture the director's vision and tell this and tell the story. But in doing that, you have to understand lenses. If someone asks for, uh, you know, a long lens or, you know, how is that, what does a long lens do? How does that affect the image? How are you going to draw it? Well, there are big differences between a long lens and a short lens. What does that mean? For stunts, do you need to hide the rig or hide the landing pads? Uh, what kind of, you know, how are, how are these different things going to be done? Uh, when you're doing camera chases, if someone's talking about a Russian arm, which now we call the Ukraine, they changed the name of it. You know, what does that mean? And, and when they're saying it, that means it has to it should go in the notes, because if the director's thinking it, the rest of the crew needs to know it. So I'm making sure that not only the drawings, but all my notes that go with it help production because it's more than just the visual. It's everything that goes behind it. So I make sure all of that is in my storyboards. Um, you have to understand editing, what cuts together. The screen direction is a huge thing. And, and the, you know, the 180 degree rule is really, in, really important. It just fails it's spectacularly as soon as you have more than two people in a scene. So, so I created a different way of handling screen direction, which, you know, I've, I've written about uh, in, in my book on storyboarding, storyboards, motion and art. And I've also in, in my LinkedIn learning courses on storyboarding, I talk about it, you know, follow the eye line. And, and it, it's too long to get into here, but I, I created a process of screen direction that is 100 percent accurate. And it's very easy to follow no matter how many people are in a scene. So, uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm in the four, I, I'm a huge studier of every aspect of filmmaking, but I also try to advance it. And then I share with others in, you know, between all my, you know, this kind of thing with you. And then all the courses I did for LinkedIn learning, I've got, I don't know, 150, 200 videos on YouTube for free for anyone, the books I've written, you know, I try to share in, in numerous different ways, everything that I've learned, discovered, or created to advance the art for every other story artist. Yeah, I, I think one really important thing they touched on is that as a storyboard artist in, in pre-production, you kind of have to have an understanding of how production works uh, because everything that you make uh, has to be then uh, created in camera or with CGI or with, with actors at some point. And uh, you have to know where the camera goes and what lenses you use. Mm -hmm. um I there's a, really there's a lot be a to voracious it. like student to film you, you you should i mean you know it's funny uh, people have asked me before you know you've been talking a lot about what you need to know and you've never mentioned drawing well it's because drawing is not the most important part you know a lot of story artists are not great illustrators you don't have to be um you have to really understand the visual storytelling but they don't have to be great uh you know and and when we're in a hurry the boards are not going to look like this, you know, you know, the, the, you know, if I have time, they're going to look really nice and clean and look like the actors, but we often don't have time for that. Now, 
there's a prerequisite where you have to understand perspective and to be able to draw anything from any angle. But you're not illustrating, you're a story artist. And there is a difference. A great illustrator does not mean they can storyboard at all. Storyboarding is its own particular type of art of visual storytelling that understands the mechanics of editing and visual storytelling. That's what people need to study. Mark, I, I know that you've been working remotely uh, since before the pandemic, but I, I wanted to know mm -hmm. if the pandemic had any impact on the work that you do. Uh, the pandemic shut everything down except for animation for like nine months. Uh, I was in the middle of storyboarding on uh, Stranger Things on the season that comes out. Well, we're recording this on a Thursday, uh, tomorrow, Friday, our time um, is when the show premieres. So it'll already be out by the time this airs. And um, I was halfway through a couple of the episodes and everything shut down. Every live action production around the world shut down overnight. And uh, there was no work. Luckily, I had some animation gigs also going on. So that's what carried me through the downtime. But when it came back, there were so many shows that were backlogged. It was there was and, and most live action story artists said the same thing. We didn't sleep for a year because there was overlapping of productions that normally were spread out through the year, but everyone needed the same crew at the same time. Uh, so the bank account went flush. I mean, that was that that part was great uh, dealing without sleep and trying to schedule because productions change schedule when they need us uh, all the time. So there's a lot of juggling going on. Um, long term, the biggest difference is everything is virtual. I stay here at my studio all the time. I have not been out on a set in two and a half years, I think, something like that. Um, so it's allowed my wife to see me more. But uh, but I miss being on location. I mean, I like the excitement of being out there and, and walking and, and acting out things with the director and figuring out stuff. I, I do miss that. Um, there's, there's a great camaraderie and, and energy from actually being out there. Uh, but I also like having a life and I've got a great place here to work in. So it's not like it's a hardship to, uh, to work here. Um, you know, and I'll work days on one show and nights on another show and through weekends all the time, just to keep up with all the production going on. Cause you know, a lot of people don't realize how many live action shows need storyboards because, you know, visual effects, you might not even see them, but they're all over the place. I mean, you know, just in the past month, I've been storyboarding everything from Mrs. Maisel to various different Walking Dead shows to um, uh, FBI and FBI Most Wanted and and Snowfall and Made for Love. And um, I can't remember all the different it, it, it's it's a bad monkey and Tom Swift, which comes out soon. And Naomi, um, you know, it's it's a it's a huge mix of. Drama, comedy, sci-fi, horror, they all need storyboards. So we just don't storyboard the entire show. We storyboard stunts, effects, special camera moves, and transitions. What do you feel is the biggest misconception about storyboarding for live action? That, that people think that most live actions don't need it. 95% uh, of what I do is live action. Now, I used to do a lot of animation, and I still do at times, but the amount of live action that needs board work keeps me insanely busy. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. A lot of people just don't realize that, that they need it. And they do. It, uh, most shows at one point or another, they might not need it for every episode, but you know, there's enough that need it where there's never a gap in, in the need. Do you have advice for a viewer who might be interested in learning about the craft of storyboarding, uh, aside from watching these great tutorials on LinkedIn Learning? Uh, well, you need to understand all aspects of, of visual storytelling. It's it's not just drawing. It's uh, it's editing. It's visual effects. It's stunts. You have to understand these things. You have to understand cameras, how they work, and how the lenses work, and um, and, and, you know, like I mentioned before, screen direction and eye lines and, um, and perspective, uh, you know, a lot of people have a hard time with perspective if you're not really trained in it. 
um, you know, not knowing perspective will kill your ability to do a good storyboard, uh, especially for live action, because there's, you know, in, in 2D animation, a lot of things are flat, you know, in, in comedy cells and just a flat image. We don't do that in live action very seldom. So you really need to be able to understand. You need to be able to read overhead plot plans in in what in what something would look like, you know, lofted in 3D when you're just looking at a plan. And you have to have various ways of working with directors because every director is different. And it's up to us to get into their head. So, you know, one, you know, working on plot plans might work for one. Acting out might work better for another. Written shot list might work better for the third. Every director is different. Um, and it's not up to us to shove, uh, shove them into our hole. We have to be able to work to get into their head. So it's, it's a camaraderie. You need to be able to work with others. So this is not a solitary thing. I mean, the drawing aspect, once it's approved is, but the visual storytelling, you have to work with someone else and understand their vision. And for me, that's a fun challenge. I don't find that limiting. I mean, you know, there's some artists who think, you know, they're all artsy fartsy and, and it's like, well, it needs to be my way. I'm the creator. It's like, what? then do your own thing. That's fine. But when you're on these big productions, there's, like I said, up to 700 people in some of these productions. I find it a great challenge to, if, if I can get into that director's head and illustrate like what I was showing comparison, that to me is a challenge and a success if I'm able to do that. So I don't find that limiting in the least. In fact, I learn from these directors. Every director I work with, I pay attention to everything, how they look at it, how they're setting it up. And then I'll use that as inspiration on the next project and one after that that I'm working on. So it's like con constant film school where I'm always learning new techniques and other ways of doing things. You know, I keep my, I keep open to, oh, I hadn't thought about doing that. That's really cool. And, and there are certain things that you see over the years, like how we shoot people driving cars, the framing over the past year has changed. And now there's a, an ongoing thing where you want to set, where you want the person off center. So you see the road on half and the car just on half rather than everything within the car. Uh, you know, so there's, there's visual changes. And then the, you've got to watch whatever medium you're storyboarding in. If you're a 2d animator, watch a lot of 2d cartoons. And for 2d, you have to be able to emulate whatever style that cartoon is. For live action, it, it, you, there is no particular style, just can't be cartoony. Um, you know, everyone has their own style of drawing. That's fine, as long as it's not cartoony. Um, so, you know, life drawing, a lot of life drawing and, and quick sketches. Um, you know, if you have time to clean it up, like some of the samples I've been showing, that's great. But if you don't, they better still make sense and be able to show, you know, show what the action is where it's clear. Mark, do you have any other storyboards that you'd like to uh, show off before we run out of time? You know what? I've got another sample here of um, from Fear the Walking Dead. Here's another storyboard comparison. This is this is a really cool piece. This is the uh, the season opener for last this past season, season seven. Where um, we're coming up near the end of season seven right now. But if you look at this. Even that possum, the dead possum up in the corner, you can see in my storyboard, it's actually in the live action, how close this is. Now, this is uh, Michael Satrazemis is the director, and I've worked with him a lot over the years. So we've got a shortcut on, on how he tells me things and how quickly I can get into his head. I know his shots. I know what he likes. So it's, it's very quick working with him. You know, when you, when you work with someone over and over, you get that shorthand. But again, when I, you know, when I cut this together and I saw how close, like I didn't, obviously I didn't know the tree. I, this is, this is actually a set that they had built. I didn't know those trees were even there. So, but then when you look at things like this, you know, this is a lighthouse. They, this was a set that they built. They sent me the mm -hmm. floor plans and photos of it as they were building it. So looking at this, I was able to look at even the window. You can see I have the window in the exact right spot. It's incredibly accurate, which again helps everybody. The more accurate my storyboards are, the less questions everyone in production will have when the director says, all right, we're doing 
shot 20, uh, you know, scene 23, shot 37. Everyone looks at it and goes, okay, camera guys know exactly what they need to do. I mean, they can look at and know what lens they need. Uh, and that's when I know I've done a good job, when I can be this accurate on how to represent. And then, of course, the motion, you know, everything you see in the animatic is what I presented to them in, in, uh, in pre-production. I didn't change anything when I edited this together. You know, you're, what you're seeing, the, the length of the shot's a little bit different. I adjusted that to match the edit. But I did not change any of the boards or, or motions at all. So, yeah, I still get such a thrill. And, and even using the animated transparency in Storyboard Pro, I can have someone walk out of the, uh, out of the fog. You know, shifting perspective here. I mean, look how accurate that is. Uh, it's, oh, I, just, I get such a kick out of this. 15 miles, maybe. It appears our plane has already drawn a few bombs. Um, you know, and, and I kind of went nuts on, on this one on even animating the moving uh, the moving lights in the background. It just kept it alive. It only took a second to do it. So it, it's not really adding any time, but it adds a lot to the feel of the animatic when production looks at it and, and the feel the director gets on what the final piece will look like. So I add those little things in and I do my own scratch track on the voices. So we get a feel for how long the shot needs to last. And, you know, I try to give them everything, you know, even down to here, um, he's about to throw this kid off the roof. And you can see every motion. I mean, it's exact. So, you know, that I get such a kick out of this. I mean, obviously, I still love what I do. Um, and uh, and in editing these things together just reminds me how much fun it is uh, to check it out. So, Mark, we're almost out of time. Where can our viewers find more of your work? Well, my uh, my main website is storyboards-east.com. So there's tons of samples of both boards and animatics on there and links to tons of other things. Um, if you have access to LinkedIn Learning, I've got, I don't know, 10 different courses. I think four courses, four or five courses just on storyboarding. I've, uh, and in particular with Storyboard Pro, I've got... Uh, the Essentials of Storyboard Pro, I've got uh, Advanced Storyboard Pro, and Storyboarding in 3D uh, within Storyboard Pro using the 3D tools, because I use that a whole lot. Um, uh, both, you know, bringing 3D objects in as a 2D element and 3D camera moves. I do all of it uh, constantly. So I, I find that's really beneficial to know and, and to be able to use. So uh, there's a lot on LinkedIn Learning, or just look up my name on YouTube. There's so many uh, videos on there. Um, Doom Boom shot a, a huge amount. I was up at your studios um, years and years ago, one of the early versions of Storyboard Pro. Uh, we shot a whole a big course there. Uh, so now that is still up there. So, I mean, there's it's easy to find the stuff. Just search for my name and, and storyboarding. You'll find cool stuff. Yeah, I can't recommend your videos enough. They're fantastic. And mm -hmm. uh, I also want to thank you for this discussion. It was real joy. I also want to thank um, our viewers for joining us for the Animation Trends event. This is the first three-day virtual event that we've hosted. So be sure to visit toomboom.com to see our full schedule of free interviews, panel discussions, and live art events. You won't want to miss any of it, so be sure to tune in to the next interview.